Hi, my name is Connie Russman. Together with my colleagues Ricardo Wilson Grau, Richard Smith, and John Morimutu, I would like to introduce you to a study that used outcome harvesting to evaluate a global voluntary environmental network, namely Bionet. I used to work as Global Program Officer for the Bionet Global Secretariat, along with Richard, at that time the Director of the Secretariat, and John, the Regional Program Officer. In 2010, we introduced outcome mapping as a planning and monitoring tool for Bionet. We found the approach to be very useful and therefore decided to use outcome harvesting, which is based on outcome mapping principles, for the summative evaluation of the five-year Bionet Global Program end of 2010. We did so even though the Bionet Program had not been designed using outcome mapping. This ability to use outcome harvesting where outcome mapping has not previously been used is one of its advantages. We were happy that we could contract Ricardo Wilson Grau for the evaluation, who is the lead developer of outcome harvesting. Under his expert guidance, the evaluation was quite successful. It dealt with the complex challenges in our network and the outcome harvesting process itself was very participatory and therefore also very time intensive, but it definitely increased learning and self-reflection at various levels of our network. Ricardo, Richard and John will now each take a minute or so to answer three common questions about the use of outcome harvesting in general and this evaluation in particular. John will make a start. Over to you, John. My name is John Morimuti and I will explain why we believe that applying outcome harvesting has several particular advantages for evaluating networks. In contrast to traditional organisations, central control in networks is loose and authority is diffused. Network members have multiple mandates so the network hat is just one of the many hats that those in the network wear. The fact that Bionet is a global voluntary network further reduces the possibility of centralised decision making. Here are two ways in which outcome harvesting proved especially appropriate for this situation of diffused control and diverse membership. Firstly, there was the often vexed issue of attribution or ownership of outcomes. While members agreed that a lot had been achieved under the Bionet umbrella, there was a sense of frustration about the lack of clarity concerning what constituted a Bionet outcome and what was an outcome of the Bionet members. Outcome harvesting, with its emphasis on contribution, helped to resolve this attribution issue. Drawing on outcome mapping principles, Bionet outcomes were defined as observable changes in the behaviour, relationships, activities and actions of social actors that were influenced in a small or large way, directly or indirectly, intentionally or not, by Bionet. Thus the evaluation focused on the network's contribution to social change, instead of just ticking off particular deliverables that could be attributed to specific network members. In an accompanying contribution statement, we also gathered explicit information on who did what, when and where to bring about the change. So the evaluators obtained information on which particular network components or members have contributed to the outcome. A further reason for using outcome harvesting was that the activities of a diverse voluntary network, like Bionet, were likely to contribute to outcomes that could not be precisely planned for or predicted in advance. Outcome harvesting empowered the secretariat and network representatives by permitting them to identify outcomes beyond those articulated in the Bionet organisational plan and log frame. Now over to Ricardo. Hello, I'm Ricardo Wilson Grau. An important question I'm often asked as an evaluator is how can you be sure that outcome harvesting is rigorous and credible? The question is particularly important because of the highly participatory nature of outcome harvesting. The primary informants are those closest to the action. There are people who are working to influence a change in behavior, relationships, policies, or practices of another social actor. The evaluators, or the harvesters, work with the primary informants to craft written descriptions that they together agree are the outcomes. Nonetheless, the information may be objectively mistaken, as well as subjectively disputable. Therefore, 
in the BioNet evaluation, we took two measures to verify and substantiate their perspectives. First, we evaluators subjected the data to a rigorous review. Each one of the outcomes was examined by us all, as well as by several network coordinators. We all ensured that the outcomes did indeed describe observable changes and did so in a sufficiently concrete, coherent, and plausible way. Second, to complement the perspective of the primary informants, we agreed with the primary intended users of the harvest findings that we would verify our selection of outcomes with up to three substantiators. The substantiators are people who were knowledgeable about the change in the social actor and independent of Bionet. Thus, the outcomes would be considered sufficiently credible for the intended users. We asked substantiators to go on record with their views about the accuracy and preciseness of the outcome as drafted. Furthermore, to enrich our understanding of the outcome, we asked them for explanatory comments. In sum, in outcome harvesting, you triangulate the information sources through written documents and then both primary informants and substantiators that go on public record. Consequently, you make sure that the data is as rigorous and credible as necessary for its intended uses. Hello, my name is Richard Smith. A question I'm asked as an evaluator using outcome harvesting is how much time will informants need to devote to participating in the evaluation? Well, as a participatory approach to monitoring and evaluation, I suggest outcome harvesting is not well suited to those projects or programs who want to limit their role to the provision of documentary sources and an interview with the evaluator. Those choosing to invest time in outcome harvesting should do so for the benefits they anticipate their participation will bring. But how much time is actually needed from the program and others? This depends on several variables, the number of outcomes you wish to extract, the length and content of outcome description that will be most useful to you and other users of the evaluation, the extent evaluators will be able to extract accurate outcome descriptions from your written sources, and how quickly you and other informants will be able to describe results in terms of behaviour change outcomes. In the Bionet case, to harvest nearly 200 outcomes, 10 regional coordinators invested four to eight hours each, and the three of us in the Secretariat three to four days each. That's quite an investment. In a voluntary network or partnership, securing such participation may be particularly challenging. We largely succeeded in doing so in Bionet evaluation because of the motivation of the staff and network coordinators alike. But was it worth it? In short, yes. The evaluation was greatly appreciated by staff, board and network coordinators, not only as an independent assessment of our effectiveness, but very much also for the insights it gave us about how our results as a network were best understood as contributions to behaviour changes at the policy, institutional or individual levels. Well, we hope we've tickled your interest and answered some of your questions about using outcome harvesting for evaluations. For more, Follow the link to our paper on the Better Evaluation website and don't hesitate to get in touch with any of us with queries or thoughts, whether great or small. Thank you.